Um, we show first the Saturn system, and then we zoom quickly to the uh, E-ring that is Enceladus is embedded in, in, and then Enceladus with the plume at the bottom, uh, southern hemisphere, and a zoom in of the plume and an animation. The plume is made of icy grains and, and, and gas as well. The icy grains are providing the scattered light that provides the image in this case. If we go on to the next graphic, we'll get an idea of, of the geometry of the flyby. In July, of uh, this shows Enceladus once again, and the plume is shown in, in pseudo color to give you a perspective on things. Uh, if we go to the next graphic, you'll see the first flyby we made in March of 2005. This is the green era. We got fairly close to Enceladus. Uh, at the time of the planning, we did not know that Enceladus had a plume. So this was the discovery of the plume itself on this flyby. Uh, we were fairly lucky in getting close enough to, to see the plume and understand what was going on. And in the second graphic, once we knew the plume was there, we had the opportunity, excuse me, going on to the next graphic, uh, we had the opportunity to target this, particularly for looking, uh, getting very close to taste and smell the plume itself. The composition was the main thing that we were going for. Uh, you see, we came within 50 kilometers quite close, and then we uh, proceeded out along the plume axis. If so if we could go to the animation, you'll get a better idea of, of what that sequence looked like. Here we are, we're coming in from the north in this sequence with the spacecraft. We'll get very close to the planet. Uh, we're moving in a direction to maximize the composition measurements during that flyby, pass by, and then on the way back out, we did the thermal infrared measurements with the composite infrared spectrometer. So um, those, these are the two important observations that were made. Uh, the, the plume shown in this particular graphic here was uh, where we were really looking at the composition. And if we can transition from there to the next, the first piece of data from the ion neutral mass spectrometer in the next figure, then you'll get an idea of, of how rapidly the rise in water density occurred as we, as we moved over the plume. So you can see the density increase very dramatically as we moved over the plume. But water was not the only constituent that we saw. If we go on to the next graphic, we can get an idea of what w w the taste and smell of the plume. Uh, I said the line I used earlier was it's carbonated water with the essence of natural gas, which is not far from the facts in this case. Water vapor was the major constituent. There was methane present. There was carbon dioxide. There was carbon monoxide. There were simple organics and there were more complex organics. Uh, the simple organics com were composed of materials such as acetylene, hydrogen cyanide, formaldehyde, um, and ethane. The more complex organics included things such as propane, propine, and acetonitrile. So those are the constituents we saw. Now, uh, we try, the uh, question that one, one would ask is where did the organics come from? Uh, of course, natural gas comes from decaying organic or uh, biological matter on Earth, but this is not the conclusion we reach uh, for Enceladus. Um, another possibility is is the interior, the geochemistry going on in the interior. That can also produce organics. However, if we go to the next graphics, the simplest explanation is that the, the composition of the plume is very much like the composition of a, of a comet. If we're looking at the abundance, uh, and the different bars show the abundance level. So there was 90% water, there was a little bit of methane, there was carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide is shown here, and then the simple organics and the more complex organics. They're all shown with the bars and they're labeled. Uh, then we show with the brackets what the composition, the variability in the composition of comets might be in the same situation. So we can see that it's quite similar to the comet composition. Uh, finally, one would ask about the astrobiological potential. Does, does it, the fact that it looks like a comet de decrease the, uh, our in interest in the astrobiological potential? And the, and the, question, and the answer is absolutely no. Uh, organics are one of the three ingredients that we need or that we use as a measure of astrobiological potential. And the organics are clearly there in abundance beyond what we expected. 
In addition to that, one would be looking for liquid water and for a source of energy. And to discuss that aspect of things, I'll defer to John Spencer. Thanks, Hunter. Yes, we've been looking at Enceladus, Enceladus in a very different way using the composite infrared spectrometer on board. And this looks at the surface of Enceladus and measures the temperatures and the heat radiation there. So the first graphic that I have shows the view of Enceladus we got uh, the last time we flew past in 2005. And you see the thing that really blew us away when we first saw this is down at the South Pole, you have this very bright glow of heat coming out of the South Polar region. Um, and if we go to the next graphic, we can put this in some context because we also, with the Cassini cameras, got some pictures of the uh, South Polar region during this, that flyby in 2005. And we see these four diagonal fractures, huge fractures, about 80 miles long, cutting across the South Polar region. Um, and when you superimpose the heat map on top of that, on the right-hand side, you see that there is a lot of heat coming out from just that same area as where the fractures are. We uh, saw temperatures as high as about minus 200 Fahrenheit, which sounds awfully cold, and it is, but the background temperature of the surface is less than minus 300 Fahrenheit. So these things really stood out as warm compared to that very cold background. And so it seemed like there was heat coming out of the interior of Enceladus. So on this new flyby, having made this discovery last time, we really wanted a closer look. And what we did is, from much closer to Enceladus, after Hunter made his measurements, we were able to scan that region inside the white box uh, to see more detail. And the next graphic shows what we found. This is now the new data from that region inside the white box, showing now we see the heat coming out along each of those fractures individually. We see a great deal of detail here. We see a continual line of, of heat radiation along the fractures, but a lot of variation, some areas being much brighter than others. We see some areas that are not on these main tiger stripe fractures at all, but up in the right-hand corner, there's interesting other stuff going on. This is a beautiful map of where the action is on the south pole of Enceladus. Um, now, the composite infrared spectrometer doesn't just take images like this. We get a spectrum at every point, and that allows us to measure the temperature fairly precisely. And we just happened to get lucky that our best data was over the brightest tiger stripe. Um, that's what we call these fractures down in the lower right corner. And so there we were able to get a nice temperature measurement. And we saw temperatures as high as minus 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which again sounds pretty cold, but this is enormously higher than the background temperature, less than 300 Fahrenheit, less than minus 300 Fahrenheit. And means we have a great deal of energy being delivered to the surface in this region. Um, and so this is really interesting because if we're seeing temperatures up to minus 135 degrees on the surface, we know it's going to be even warmer below that. And it's not out of the bounds of possibility that somewhere down below we're getting temperatures up approaching the uh, temperature of liquid water. Whatever is producing this heat on the surface is going to be producing even more heat underneath. So we're not seeing liquid water or those temperatures, but we're everything we see as the closer we look, the more energy we see, the higher temperatures we see. And it's entirely possible that there's going to be liquid water not too far below the surface of these warm fractures. Um, now, we have other data that we've taken recently with the Cassini cameras, uh, which allows us to locate exactly where these geysers are coming out of. And the last graphic shows those uh, locations. This is from previous work done by the Cassini imaging team showing the main sources of the jets coming out of the South Pole, these geysers. And you see that there's quite a nice correlation with where the heat is coming out. Um, the, the fractures tend, the plumes tend to be coming out of the warmest points on the fractures. And so we're really beginning to get this very comprehensive picture. We have images of the surface to see the geo geology. We can see where the plumes are coming from. We can see where the heat is coming from. Other Cassini instruments are measuring the composition of the surface directly. Um, but we have even more ways of, of observing the plume and uh, because there's so many wonderful instruments on Cassini that can look at the plume in so many different ways. And Larry Esposito will talk about some new results from another of the Cassini instruments. Yes, thank you, John. So I'd like to talk about the results from the ultraviolet imaging spectrograph. And that sort of investigation is a little bit different from the previous two. Instead of going into the plume and measuring it as Hunter did or looking at the surface and measuring that with a spectrometer. Instead, we watch a star as it passes behind the plume. And in the visual that you're seeing here, the horizontal green arrow uh, 